Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this last session of our Marathon of Talks Festival, the Vienna Humanities Festival. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight uh, Ekaterina Djogat, uh, who is an internationally renowned Russian art historian, art writer and curator, working in Moscow and internationally, most recently in Köln as artistic director of the Akademie der Künste der Welt, and what is probably even more uh, relevant for, for this audience here, she was recently selected and as of 1st of January next year, she will become the artistic director of Steirische Herbst. Um, Ekaterina Djogut is um, a specialist in Russian art of the 20th century and of contemporary uh, Russian art. And her work as a curator, art historian, writer, initiator of discussions is and discussion platforms is so big uh, and so impressive. I can never, if I have to list it all, the one hour that we have will be gone. So I will just uh, mention uh, a selection. Uh, she was working as a senior curator at the State uh, Tretyakov Gallery. Um, she's a regular contributor to international art journals and magazines such as Art Forum, Fries, Iflux. She was curator of the Russian Pavilion in 2001, Venice uh, Biennale. She has curated a number of um, research intensive exhibitions on Soviet art and, and Russian contemporary art. Uh, to mention uh, just a few, body memory, underwear of the Soviet era, this was in the year 2000, um, struggling for the banner Soviet art between Trotsky and Stalin in 2008, an exhibition on Dmitry Prigov in 2008, and so on and so on. In 2012, she developed the discussion platform of the first Kiev Biennale for contemporary art, Arsenal, um, and, and, yeah, so let's stop here. <laughs> the list is really, really long. Welcome, Ekaterina, welcome to Vienna and the Humanities Festival. When we discussed this um, conversation uh, beforehand, we, we were talking that what is, would be interesting for us, for me and for the audience, is to learn about the Russian art of the revolution, the avant-garde art that we usually uh, when we just hear the term, uh, na the names of Malevich, Elisitsky, or Konstantin Yuan pop up to our minds. Um, and as we were talking, Irina said, no, 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 you got it completely wrong. It's uh, actually the case that in the Western world, people completely misunderstand what the art of the Russian Revolution is. So, uh, what I asked uh, Ekaterina is to tell us her reading and uh, share with us her knowledge about the art of the uh, Russian Revolution and in this way enlighten our discourse. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Desi, very much uh, for the introduction. Thank you also for the invitation. I'm the very last one. It's a big responsibility. Uh, I have to warn you that I'm consciously not using the PowerPoint. I'm using images in, in rather the documentary capacity, so they will not be the, those beautiful, uh, like spectacular images. They will re, re kind of still have some sort of a, uh, you know, technical documentary quality. This is uh, intentional. Uh, well, the question uh, also it's very condensed in time, so hopefully. Uh, it will work that I could develop um, my argument. So the question I want to ask, and I asked myself when I was invited, is how to represent Russian Revolution? Uh, this question is not purely theoretical for me as a curator or editor, and for each of you it can become a very practical question, like which image to take uh, to illustrate uh, the idea of October Revolution. So we can switch to images at that Time, yes. Okay, so, but I don't see here which images I have. Uh-huh, 
and this is how it will be. Okay, so okay, so this one will be here. Yeah, I understand, but yeah, this is very practical technology. Yeah, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> so the answer to this question is usually clear. So when we have books uh, or exhibitions, it's usually some sort of a geometrical abstract work. Uh, mostly, so does it work? Yes. Uh, uh, mostly by Malevich or Lisitsky uh, or Lyubov Popova. Uh, and yeah, those uh, visual cliches, they're still working, they immediately tell us this is about um, Russian Revolution. As me, as uh, every other Russian, uh, especially professionals who are in this room, I guess they're also extremely annoyed by that sort of cliches, uh, not just because it's old. I love uh, Malevich and Lisitsky and uh, all of them, they're great artists, they're also others, but most of them actually uh, dropped that sort of stylistic themselves at some point. And most of those works that, uh, like this one for instance, was done, were done actually before the revolution. So they could represent some sort of a desire for the new world, but there is of course this very Western idea that uh, innovation in social life uh, should be accompanied by a revolution and innovation in style and it would be very good if they would be like going together but it, it is not like it happened like the artistic revolution actually happened before and the political and social meaning of it is uh, something very complex and this their relationship uh, to uh, to the october socialist revolution so what what i as a curator would have shown and what I did show, I'll show you some examples now. So uh, that is um, Mark Penson. It's a photograph, a very poignant one. I really love it, where like it's not really clear what these people are waiting for with uh, this banner, uh, and what are the others that are on the other side of the river? Will will they ever met? Will anything ever happen here? Uh, this uh, painting by Boris Golopolosov, which is called R Resurrection. Again, uh, something tragic is happening here. Again, two disconnected uh, parts of people who we don't, we are not even sure they know about uh, each other, and they are kind of lost in this urban landscape. Or um, this drawing by Solomon Nikritin, one of the greatest Soviet artists completely unknown in the West. Uh, it is explicitly called revolution drawn in words. Uh, for those who speak Russian, revolutsiya zakhlebnuvshiyse phrase. Well, um, how can one interpret this uh, me proposing those works instead of the others? So they are, of course, figurative and realistic. Um, I could interpret, and I actually would agree to that, I could interpret my uh, point here as a decolonizing one. So instead of uh, agreeing uh, to the very West, and it's actually not a secret that the West selects uh, from all the traditions, including uh, Soviet avant-garde, something which they already know, something they close to their sensibility. Uh, so let's say geometrical abstraction, uh, which is immediately being valorized. And the other things that are less understandable and seem like obsolete, so that they are not being valorized. So this is my, of course, my argument against this narcissistic idea of Western modernism. Uh, in a way, decolonizing, one, one could have developed this point, but I'm not doing it now. It's of course also clear that those three works I've shown, they, are done, they were done later. It's not the immediate representation of October Revolution. Although if we say art of October Revolution, which means like something that what created in October and November of 1917, we will hardly find anything. Or if we will, it, will, it might be some cabaret or some actually still life uh, with flowers. Uh, that definitely artists we know by, by the memoirs of the artists, this is what many of them were actually thinking about at this moment. Nobody actually did understand in Moscow or Petersburg that something historical is taking place and nobody knew that this is October Revolution. So they thought it's just everyday life. So the representation of revolution is happening later. This is also a very important point, that the reflection of it happened at least 10 years later. 
And so those works were created in the late 20s, early 30s. This was the moment of reflection on uh, the revolution. One should also remember that there was a song in uh, Soviet radio when I was a kid, uh, which was saying, revolution has a beginning, but revolution doesn't have an ending. Doesn't have an end, it never ends. Yes to revolution начала, не to revolution конца. This is how it was seen actually in Soviet Union that the revolution still continues. Still, of course, the October Revolution did end at some point, and now China Mieville and other people are debating did it end in 21 or in 24, or maybe in 27, or maybe in 32, but certainly no later than mid 30s. So the whole rhetorics of the 20s and early 30s that the revolution is still going on. And around mid-30s, like we achieved something. So this moment of the ending of revolution, it's very important that in all those works I've shown, the sense of defeat is being integrated. This revolution is uh, not really successful. It is being defeated already by itself or by, uh, by what Trotsky uh, described as those internal contradictions or, or by something else. So those two notions, re realism and sense of defeat, and what I will try to demonstrate that how they are very closely related to each other. So in this, because it, these are realistic images, they already carry in themselves this sense of defeat, and this is very important in a representation of October Revolution. Just a very brief uh, note, uh, abstract painting. The Western tradition uses the word abstract painting. Russian tradition uses the word non-objective painting, There is a difference here, because the Russian term non-objective painting does not only mean that the painting does not represent an object. Mainly it means that the painting is not an object itself. It's not a thing, it's not a commodity, it's rather a medium that is transporting meaning. This is why early avant-garde artists actually very enthusiastically started to paint those wagons, those trains, uh, because the painting became something which was moving from place to place uh, instead of being an object itself. So this is just to show that this is discrepancy between abstract and figurative was seen totally differently in Russian context. That was actually absolutely irrelevant if something that was painted on this train was abstract or figurative. What was relevant that the use of it, that it was moving and that it was transporting ideas and meanings. So it was spread. But the to turn towards representation, actually, I, I would argue that we know very precisely when it happened. And the, the 7th of November of 1920, famous Soviet theater director Nikolai Yevrenov was commissioned a reenactment of October Revolution on the same place, on the Palace Square in St. Petersburg. And this is a, a sketch of a stage designer Yuri Anenkov who worked with him. So we see here that there were three parts. Uh, there were two allegorical parks, parts to the left and to the right. The white part and the red part, they were representing something, some sort of a mystery. And there was a central part that was a pure reenactment of an event actually that never took place in this form. We all know that there was no such a thing actually as a people taking the Winter Palace, it never happened. They were just waiting outside till people inside uh, at the end surrendered. But this reenactment represented something that never took place and people very enthusiastically joined this moment. Uh, and this actually was later presented in lots of photographs. So here we have some artistic part, but this photo was very often used as a, still you can buy it on Getty Images, the image of October Revolution, although of course it has nothing to do with uh, reality. Yeah, so it's the reenactment of um, Yevrenov. And what is interesting, <coughs> that there was this turn, Yevrenov till then was a mystery, myst myst mysteria um, director, and he turned into not even realism, but pure direct representation, and there are texts of him where he's describing everything which is taking place there as actors. Of course, all the people who are 
standing, just standing and watching the actors also, because they are joining at the end. And the Winter Palace, what is interesting for my argument, he's writing the Winter Palace itself is becoming an actor here, uh, and um, who brings his mimics and internal sensibilities into the picture. So everything is becoming an actor. And this is how I propose to look at Soviet realist painting, post-avant-garde, which is very important. Uh, I will be showing artists who already did some abstract avant-garde works, like Malevich, let's say, and who after mid-20s or beginning of 20s, gradually or sometimes very abruptly, turning to uh, representation, and they are creating something which we could describe as uh, theatrical. So this is Konstantin Retko, who's, uh, again, it's a representation of the same moment, but it's 1925, uh, the insurrection, uh, with uh, now in this case already, it's not just buildings that are actors here, but also Stalin, Trotsky, and all the others whom uh, you can or cannot uh, recognize here. But Malevich himself, if we look at other paintings by Malevich, we will see the, how he and Malevich is always very explicit about what he is actually doing, not, not precisely about the topic, but how he is approaching the very medium of painting. Look at it, how all of people whom he is painting those years trying to say us something, how, how they are uh, actors here, including himself. So this. Um, he really tries to stress those elements of painting. So it's, it's a very subtle thing I'm trying to say here. It's not about that they are, those people behave theatrically. It's the painting of Malevich that behaves uh, theatrically. There is this theater of representation. So he sees representation not as something very actually uh, normal that was used already for several uh, centuries. Uh, and uh, no, it's becoming again a problem, a rhetorical problem, how to represent it and how to represent it so every element um, of painting would, be, would become an actor, so to speak. And some of the Soviet artists actually uh, did it like literally. Uh, so you certainly know Gustav Klutzis and some of his posters, and this is how he was creating those posters. There were his friends that were dressed and were posing, and he was first making photographs, and then, uh, and then uh, they were like, I would say, star, stars of his posters. Or uh, Lisitsky, you also know, of course, his uh, famous posters, but this is how it was prepared. Some real people who are starring in this film of Lisitsky, so to speak. So what I want to say here, this, we should look at those paintings, uh, especially paintings, because paintings are usually, uh, we see them as something like really poor in quality like this portrait of Alexander Samokhvalov, one of the first communar members of authentic communes in the early 30s. Uh, we should look at them as we look at, let's say, okay, let's say you're, you're going to a theater, a uh, real theater, live, and uh, you are very interested in the director, what he's doing, but you see that, okay, this evening, one of the actors or maybe two of the actors are not at their best. That happens. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't change for you that the whole thing is actually great. Okay, today that part was not really good. Okay, maybe tomorrow it will be different. It's actually very different in film because film we already see this is why it's so disturbing when people in film, are, when actors are bad in film. It really spoils, spoils you everything. But in theater I think we are much more tolerant because it's not at that we are looking. And actually if actors are the best in, this, in theater, that's probably not a very good piece, right? So because we are actually expecting something bigger. Uh, but in painting somehow we are not that tolerant. Yeah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't like from contemporary point of view tolerate it. But I'm saying that we should actually, we should see it from this, uh, in this like theatrical, theatrical uh, context. So I'm almost, uh, I'm almost, almost finished. So some other portraits of those, what is also important for me, that those people who are represented here, it's Alexander Pahomov, another portrait of another communard. 
So these people are actors of their life. That's very important that these are not portraits of someone passive, like you know, 18th century, beautiful woman just sitting there. So these are people who like actively changed their life, and this is why they deserve to be part of those portraits, even if those portraits are not that glamorous, and it's rather there is something tragic about it. Yeah, don't you think that they look uh, some a little bit like Fayum portraits, or this is um, Filonov's also, he, he's like, it's like he's dead already, yeah, and we know, of course, from, from Game of Thrones, when you have this blue eyes, it means you're a zombie. Yeah, so he's, he is a zombie, and, so, and, and there is something very tragic there. And my uh, last uh, point here is that there is something tragic uh, inherently about that sort of realism which I would describe as a non-academic realism. It's very important that most of those artists, all, almost all of them, did not have this uh, 19th century academic education where they were like really uh, knowing how to draw it. Most of them were actually almost or completely self-taught artists, including Malevich, actually. So he was not really drawing well, as we know, like in realistic sense. So that sort of, um, that sort of style, has some tragic impossibility of reaching perfection in it. And this tragic feeling, this is something we, at least I am reading, sometimes you can laugh at those paintings, but those humor is at the same time tragic because we are, we are laughing because it's not reaching some level of perfection we expect, but there is also something very poignant about it. And many artists knew that, and many artists actually did this on uh, purpose. So the sense of defeat of realism and sense of defeat of revolution are somehow coming together. And the last painting I'm showing is the, one of the late paintings by Malevich, which is called uh, Merging. It's merging of the city and countryside. It's shown here, this dialectical merging. Uh, and of course, uh, they're not really merging. Yeah? So they're like looking at each other in total like, uh, they really don't understand what it is about. And there is someone we don't know uh, in the center, this strange figure, which whom I would interpret as, as Malevich himself. I don't know, the artist who's trying, struggling to put together all elements of this strange, uh, weird painting. It's not really working. It's not a masterpiece. But precisely because of that, precisely this is not a masterpiece. It makes it so important for me and it makes me such an important document of what, of what those times actually were. Thank you. Um, um, thank you very much. I will leave enough uh, time for discussion, but um, so prepare your questions already. But um, I would like to start with, start with a few questions uh, myself. Um, Art had a very prominent uh, role in the Russian, in the Soviet Revolution. Um, and it's not only visual art, it's theater, literature, poetry, film. We all remember Lenin saying that film is the most important art form. Uh, art was seen, and circus? Film and circus. That was the exact phrase. One more thing we learned today from you. Um, Art seemed to be uh, used as a force of the revolution. It was a very important force in creating this new world that the revolutionaries wanted to establish and to abolish the, the old world. Uh, how much was this genuine um, kind of ideologization of the artists that brought uh, that really thriving of some political art or political engagement with art and how much was it a result of cultural policy, so to say, of something that was seen as expected from above and somehow the, the artists were confronting, conforming to it. Maybe uh, it's a matter of periodization. Maybe there is a period when there was, that, that's my guess, um, uh, where there was this really genuine artistic energy trying to engage with the revolution or feeling obliged to engage with the revolution and maybe at certain point it turned into a almost uh, instrumentalization and a policy. 
Yeah, it's a very complex story. Uh, as I said, uh, first works of what we would describe as Russian avant-garde, avant-garde, recognizable, sorry, uh, recognizable Russian avant-garde comes in 1915. So it, they had two years uh, to, to in, indulge in total fantasies about the new world. They, of course, there was nothing concrete about it, no more than like Malevich wanted to send people to the moon uh, on those uh, you know, squares and triangles of him. And of course, uh, this was like uh, contemporary art today in some small country without, without cultural industry. They were not really known. They were financing themselves, those exhibitions. Uh, and then, the situation changes. Then the October Revolution is taking place, and of course the power is trying to find support everywhere they can, and they have this, uh, and they are of course educated people, some of, some of them were culturally uh, advanced, like uh, Lunacharsky, uh, and Lunacharsky is saying, oh, yeah, I know artists, they will help us, they will kind of, I don't know, create, uh, make us slogans or something, and then it starts to happen. So artists, are being given possibilities to exhibit, uh, not really money, but uh, you know, every month there is a big exhibition where they, they can exhibit and uh, probably even some important politicians are coming to those exhibitions. So artists are suddenly getting an incredible, uh, incredible attention. Uh, and uh, it's great to uh, say, a great thing to say that they still are thinking about art in the first place. So they still, so they are of course very glad that it's happening, but of course you have to understand that it's happening on the background of not having any food, any clothes, like all the real material life actually is destroyed, but there are lots of opportunities to art. And then it goes in different directions, but most of the artists are actually still thinking about art, but thinking about art, actually making art instrumentalized by power is one of the projects. It's one of the projects, artistic. It's not, uh, for many artists, it's actually the main thing they think about. What, uh, not for all of them, not for Malevich, uh, but for Rochenko, definitely. So, uh, at least for some years, to put himself um, in this position of helping the revolution, of realizing this revolutionary ideas. Uh, that was a unique situation. And that is what is unique about uh, October Revolution, this institutional situation that never, of course, repeated after. But can you tell us more about the context of the artistic scene during the revolutions and, so to say, the institutions of the Russian Cultural Revolution, uh, so to say? Um, what was the place of critics, of discussion forums, of exhibitions, Okay, so now you have to forget everything you know about the art uh, life uh, today, which seems like eternal. Uh, for instance, there is no art market, not not even not any possi no possibility to sell your work of any in any way. There is no other possibility to get a job. Like everything collapsed. Uh, you barely have food, you barely have place to stay. And then suddenly there is a possibility to join uh, artistic commissions. You were, you were given a job, actually. And this is not just a job, this is a possibility to do something very meaningful for this art, for instance, to send uh, this avant-garde art to some provincial cities to organize exhibitions, to do those things. And this is what is happening during uh, three, four years. An art school is being funded the Futsimas. Uh, there is a very, very vibrant scene uh, which is taking place. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, groups, of course, of artists. And as I said, they're thinking about art, the Constructivist Institute of Artistic Culture is being created. They are writing theoretical texts. They're also, to the extent of this, if, of, it is possible they maintain ties uh, and connections uh, with foreign, with European artists, but it's, uh, it's still war, it's almost impossible. Some artists are going abroad, like Lisitsky, and publishing a magazine there with which he is creating, he is creating links. Uh, but in general, it's a very, very isolated circle of artists. 
And when we think of the art of the uh, Russian Revolution, uh, immediately one other art form uh, that comes to mind, it's probably again another cliche actually, but it's the form of the political poster. Uh, the same Rodchenko that you already mentioned, or Lyubov Popova, etc. Uh, can you tell us why this art form becomes, became so prominent, uh, in your view, in the context of the revolution? Well, of course, because art, the goal of art was seen as uh, propaganda. Uh, and I actually don't see anything bad about it. So I'm, I definitely think that it was totally legitimate and we have great artworks thanks to the fact that it is propaganda, but the content of this propaganda actually changed. What is started with so-called Rosta windows. Rosta windows were the empty, empty uh, window shops of, of wi empty shops. There was nothing to sell. And artists start to use uh, those vitrines for, with political posters during the civil war time against the enemy of the civil war. Then when you mention Rochenko posters, it's a completely different thing. It happened like three, four years later. Well, well, there was already this new economic policy where the capitalism was again allowed to some extent. So there were small uh, shops uh, let's say selling, I don't know, clothing or small restaurants or something. And uh, the state was in competition with those shops. So Rachenko was hired and Stepanova, they were hired to create posters for uh, Prom. So Russian speakers probably remember this, Nigde Kromi Kak v Prome. It sounds like just a stupid advertisement, but what does it mean? That's a Mosel Prom, it's a state department store, which is in competition with those private uh, stores. And this is why the artist com is completely committed uh, to work for this private, uh, for this, uh, for this state uh, trade. Um, if, uh, can you please give me a sign if you have a question and I will immediately turn. Okay, I will. <laughs> let's turn to questions. Oh, just a second, uh, please wait for the microphone. With that train, the picture from the tr of the train, you demonstrated that uh, in the beginning, the question if something is uh, realistic or not, was figurative or abstract, that the line between that was completely different than we see it in the West today. Um, that w it wasn't the important thing. So my question is how could uh, it come to that massive polarization uh, and along the 20s, which culminated in the Stanovshina, in the end, when, uh, when they... No, 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 you have, a, you have a completely wrong picture. Well, Zhdanovchina well, is Zhdanovchina. There was no polarization in the 20s. There were like 90, 90% of the artists uh, made an evolution themselves from abstract paintings toward different sort of a figurative, but sometimes it was photography, like for Rachenko and some others. That was seen as the evolution of futurism. There was a big discussion about it, and it was not because of uh, pressure. The situation, of course, changed later, after the 30s, and Zdanovshina is 40s, it's 1940s, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, so this is, of course, very dark times. And at that time, an unofficial abstract art emerges. Even Rochenko, let's say, who uh, was very like sensitive to what's going on, uh, in the 40s, during the war, uh, and right after his painting abstract again, something he has forgotten like for 30 years already. Uh, he's turning again to it and it looks very interesting, actually very close to Jackson Pollock, whom he ne have never seen. Uh, and uh, those paintings remain totally unshown to anybody because at that moment there are already no possibility to exhibit it and this is where this unofficial art actually was born in this moment, yes. Microphone to someone else. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned this uh, Rosta tradition of uh, shop windows making posters for it and post uh, postcards. And as far as I learned, uh, Malevich and Mayakovsky they worked with this uh, and they did these posters. And so also they used this Lubok tradition of Bilderbogen, uh, uh, long tradition yeah. of telling stories. That is not 
abstract or geometric or no, non-objective. No, this is not, a, this uh, so, is not abstract. So yeah. there's a different uh, direction of, of their work in, in this uh, revolution times, isn't it? But this is already later. I, was, I don't remember when precisely Malevich uh, did paint. Uh, in any case, this was not important for him. It was just a commission he got and some money, that's clear. Uh, but I only know that in 1919 he stopped painting authentic abstract painting, so to speak, and uh, he proclaimed that from this moment on he only will have to preach. So he will be preaching, and to preach he understood, by preaching he understood actually teaching and sometimes painting another black square as an example for his lectures. We know that he painted like four or five black squares and not to sell them because it was not on the table at all. But to have, like he was moving from one city to another, from Vitebsk to Kiev to Petersburg, and he needed a black square. There was no, uh, you know, slide projectors at that time. So he uh, was painting um, another black square, like each time. Uh, but it was not, not, uh, so he stopped being an abstract painter and he started to, well, he concentrated on his um, architectural models and probably Rosta was also part of it at the time, yes. Um, more questions? Yes. <clears throat> um, having an experience of uh, being a student of different art educational institutions in Russia and here also in Europe, um, I have a feeling that how Russian avant-garde is being uh, presented to us is as if, some, if, as if something that happened um, by itself and as a, some sort of a miracle, actually. <laughs> and I wanted to ask if um, these pictures that you showed us as, a, as an example, as you said, uh, the sense of defeat of realism and defeat of revolution or the end of revolution, could they be also then um, considered like as a sort of transition from uh, to avant-garde from the preceding practices? Something that is not maybe mentioned as a transitional... Um, Towards avant-garde, you mean? Yeah. No, this is post-avant-garde. This is, as you know very well, there were hundreds of artists that were like still continuing realism like in 19th century. This is not what I mean. And without trained eye, it's probably difficult to distinguish them. But sure, there were lots of artists who were just continuing that stuff, but there were other thinking artists, yeah, so to speak. About them, we actually know that they studied abstract art first, and then they had to actually uh, do this tragic gesture, actually, of abandoning this abstraction. What was behind it, we, it's, it's a complex story. Some of them left some explanations about it, some not. Uh, but these are certainly, especially about Malevich, we know that this was something he was thinking about, and uh, this is post-abstraction. But it's, uh, you are right that it's, it's a step towards uh, Moscow conceptualism, yes. So you will definitely see some Ilya Kabakov in some of those things. Anybody wants this too? <laughs> Just uh, raise your hand when you're ready. I have a question. Then uh, you think that um, painting of Malevich and this uh, Russian avant-garde is connected more with uh, changes in uh, West, because it's not representative of revolution and changes in Russian is uh, more answer or they connected with changes with Cubism or this or. Uh, Mm, West um, paintings or pa you, you mean that the abstract paintings by Malevich are more connected to the Western avant-garde? That's what you mean? Yeah, I, I, do, I don't know it. Abstract painting with uh, uh, not abstract painting. Yeah, is uh, more connected with uh, changes in West art. Uh, more connected to West art and not yeah. to what? I didn't really understand. Event to uh, Russian Revolution. <laughs> Or changes in Russian you know, society and politics. Well, Malevich was concerned about both, uh, but he knew Russian Revolution much better than Western art. As you know, he never traveled abroad before. Actually, it was he was already 
uh, doing totally different things. And his knowledge of the contemporary Western art was actually very limited. And he didn't see himself as uh, uh, repeating something. So he was he was I don't doing say his own uh, version of it. I said connected. Mm. But he saw himself in those two <laughs> narratives. Actually. Repeating it. You think it's uh, I, not so negative. I, it's, it was uh, a lot of uh, very um, progressive uh, moving out in West mm -hmm. Europe. Yeah, it's mm. Mm. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really like the way that you spoke about what you're doing as a form of decolonizing of uh, art history by introducing other images that uh, perhaps have been overlooked or misread even. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about how you were, um, what you suggested at the beginning, that some of the abstract works have been taken up in the West and in a way made these iconic images because in some way people thought they were easier to read. Um, or that they could impute a certain political meaning um, in these images. But it, it seems like these uh, images that you've showed us now um, are much more full of political content. I mean, even if it is a tragic content or something very effective in them. Um, well, and I'm, it's very I'm, interesting why they've I'm been overlooked. I'm glad you're saying that, but it's also due to the fact that our sensibilities have changed with contemporary art uh, recently using lots of videos, uh, photographs were used again to some complex narratives in art. And therefore I hope that people can tolerate uh, that sort of painting again. Although it's being stigmatized, uh, yes, uh, I can understand that. And uh, yeah, abstract art, which I also actually love, uh, the pioneers of it, but it was more easily commercialized. Yes, that's that's true. That it fitted also the design. You know, the Art Deco is nothing else than the commercializing of the avant-garde in this uh, bourgeois way of life. Uh, it was, of course, yeah, very different. But uh, to to decolonize Soviet art is very difficult because it's not ethnic, and this is the main thing. So. Uh, I cannot it, and would never present it as Russian or like something authentically Russian that would be ridiculous. This is a Soviet internationalist, multi-ethnic uh, artistic community, but there is no possibility to decolonize that on the contemporary way of thinking, unfortunately. This is why I'm using this word in kind of as a tongue-in-cheek, yeah, kind of. Yes, could you tell us a little bit about the private collectors um, at the end of the 19th century and the access that is... Uh, you mean Shukin and Morozov? Yeah, and, and the access that, the, um, that these artists had to those collections. Yeah, th those were two collectors who famously had a great collection of uh, Picasso, Matisse, um, Brack, uh, French painters, and yes, artists privately could visit their homes and had access to them. Very typically, none of them ever bought anything from those Russian artists. Uh, contemporary artists were not in, local artists were not interesting to them. Jonas, have a question? Yeah, it was partly asked, but um, how would you, in this project, this difficult project of decolonizing the role of art in the Russian Revolution, um, how would you, at the end, define the importance or the impact of constructivist and productivist art in the sense of in scale? Because you're also you're now introducing a set of different imageries and, and practices. But do, is, there a, is there a sense of scale and impact in some way? And how would you um, make that estimation when it comes, for example, to the work of the Prolet Cult Movement and Bogdanov, which have been the last three or four years suddenly theorized enormously as an alternative to mm -hmm. uh, the constructivist and productivist movements? Mm -hmm. So you mean impact inside the uh, Soviet Union? Yes. Well, pro Prolet Cult was uh, unfortunately totally marginalized. Uh, well, everything was marginalized, but still had some, some, some sort of strange impact. So I would say if we look at the Soviet art, let's say post-war Soviet art from the point of view of 19th century 
hierarchy, we will see like there are painters, like awful academic painters and sculptors uh, who are taking this main places and probably are the most rich artists. At the same time, we would be totally overlooking, for instance, there was a very strong tradition of book design, film artists, uh, exhibition, I would say, like exhibition installation artists, and they were all either formerly constructivists themselves, or they were studying with Hutimas people, and it was like a different hierarchy which we are overlooking. And, uh, but still, you know, when I'm looking at which Soviet artists were shown, let's say, at Venice Biennial in, in the 70s, Soviet Union was organizing a group show of film artists. So which, uh, and many of them were actually, had some interesting ideas. So at least there was this hierarchy and the prolet cult was marginalized, but still till the very end of Soviet Union, I still remember there was a uh, structure of uh, those uh, institutes for non-professional artists, uh, that it was still possible to do those things. But yes, they were not getting any Lenin prizes, not presented in the museums, but maybe in some provincial museum. So this still existed. And I think if we look like what, for, what, for instance, um, made an impression, again, on artists like, let's say, Ilya Kabakov, we'll find that some of those things, like for instance, Komar and Melamid did study of in, with one of those uh, like former Futema's students. It's somehow strangely, there are those influences which we can find, but if we look traditionally, it all was almost destroyed. Question? Um, yes, actually, one thing I wanted to ask you, but you already touched just now on it, but maybe if you can go in more detail, is about whether you see the roots of the contemporary art practice in, in, in Russia or second half of the, uh, or after the 70s, uh, artistic practice, conceptual art, etc. Whether you as an art historian can find roots of these practices in the art scene of the revolution. Uh, you mean the roots of contemporary practices in the yes. art scene uh, of the revolution? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, to find direct influences is very difficult, uh, but every, I bet that every Russian artist today, even very young, would rather identify with those realistic paintings than with early avant-garde. Uh, it's like, for us, it's uh, avant-garde is our antiquity in the sense like, okay, this is something totally, totally not ours. So we can, we can be really, you know, respectful of it, but it's uh, difficult to identify. Still, how to work with all of it, how to work with this complex story, well, sometimes artists are trying, yes, uh, and there is interest also to Soviet theory, as you know, Mikhail Lifshitz, uh, who was writing about it. Uh, yes, we can, we can somehow see it, but it's not just in Russia. Again, uh, Okvin Weiser uh, is uh, showing lots of um, artists from Middle East and Africa who are also doing drawings. And this is not something a Western artist would rather do, but an artist uh, somewhere over there is making drawings of those um, revolutionary, I don't know, Egypt, uh, Egyptian spring and those things, and we see it in realistic form. So let's say Okvin Weser is one of those curators who is not afraid of realism because he's coming kind of from a uh, different tradition, probably, I don't know. So some influences are there, uh, but not, not very directly. In one of the articles uh, that I read of yours, you were underlying the um, radical and genuine anti-capitalist nature of the art of the revolution, of the Soviet revolution. And I was wondering whether you find, uh, because now we live in the era of a crisis, global crisis of capitalism, whether you see uh, artistic practices in the recent years that are, reviving in a way or stepping on a tradition of the Russian revolutionary art and in this way Rina, uh, yeah, bring it contemporary. Uh, you mean all over the so world? Uh, yes, yes of not course. only Russian. Uh, I mean, of yeah. course, I would say that the whole uh, 
the whole tradition of that sort of thinking was based on some rumors artists had about Russian avant-garde, like all these boys uh, proclaiming that every, every man is an artist, like Sergei Tretyakov proclaimed it uh, much earlier. Or uh, like Jan Flavin, his version of uh, Naum Gabo. Uh, this dream of uh, Soviet avant-garde was always there, of course, and was showing the way. It's a tragic thing how to the both sides of Iron Curtain artists were dreaming about them, about the other. Like artists in avant-garde artists in the West, uh, post-avant-garde, were dreaming about socialist ideal, and artists in Soviet Union were dreaming about some very abstract idea of capitalism they never have seen. So they, for them it was just a science fiction story. Uh, but that was, I would say, a beautiful time also, how, how it was, although very tragic and very unfortunate for people who lived there, but artistically it was an interesting, beautiful time. And now, yes, we still, we still are using those forms and this language when we want to say something lef leftist, let's say. But it's more and more difficult to, to retrieve this energy, I would say. We have to find this energy somewhere else. I'm not sure that Malevich or Lisitsky can still provide us with anti-capitalist <laughs> energy. I think it's over. Um, any more questions? Um, okay. Um, well, I was wondering, is there historically another revolution in your opinion that has created such a wealth of artistic innovation that uh, has impacted the artistic uh, development for decades and, course, and now uh, centuries uh, and which uh, can you tell French us a little revolution. bit about it of course but french revolution uh, created it's uh, boris Groys likes to talk about it uh, that it created the the very notion of art we are using now museums uh, it's all all what we understand as art today it was only there it, it was the result of uh, of the actually killing those aristocrats and appropriating uh, the uh, um, treasures in museums. So this is, this is what happened, yes. So can we say that the revolution it is truly a revolution only if it creates an art which is innovative, subversive, oh, no. changing the artistic scene? No, or is I it too far to do that? I, I wouldn't wait uh, for it, I don't know. Revolutions uh, have a very important task of uh, cleaning the air like creating um, social mobility in the first place, to, to turning the situation so something could happen that could never happen before, and mostly like uh, giving people possibility to, to come to the top and do something. If those people are, have interest in art, that's an interesting situation, but it, I, I don't think that it was always the case with all the revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, if there are any more questions? If not, I would ask my last question, because I was wondering, uh, for those of us who don't, do not know so much the Russian historiography or theory, art theory scene and literature, uh, how much the reading of the art of the Russian Revolution that you presented to us uh, tonight is a consensus in the Russian art historian context, or is it your vision that you are, it's innovative in, and it's your original reading, how much it's something that you, you're trying to create a new tradition of reading, so to say, at the art of the Russian Revolution, or is it within Russia consensus about that? Well, I would say that I probably, I don't know, others have to tell, uh, but I probably am trying to uh, not really theorize, but to do something about this general feeling. As I say, I started with rather general feeling of uneasiness of Russians with this Russian avant-garde and being rather identifying with post-avant-garde realism. So this feeling is there, as I said, for most of the people. Uh, educated, non-educated, young, old. I don't know, maybe with very young people it will change. But till now it was like that, but I'm trying to, to, to think about it and it is, yes, somehow related to what other people have written 
uh, but like Gro is mentioned, but sometimes it goes uh, it goes across it because uh, yeah, I don't think that Stalin was the, the main artist of Soviet Union, uh, and I I think I give more of a social uh, context to to those changes. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming uh, to the Vienna Humanities Festival. I know that Ekaterina just came from Steirische Helps, uh, a festival which opened just uh, two days ago, so we really appreciate that you are not there with your future baby, so to say, but uh, came to talk to us, and we are looking forward to having you here as a part of the discourse on art in the Austrian context, and we're expecting for you to completely throw it away, uh, uh, <laughs> change it as much. well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.